Well, good afternoon, friends. Um, excited uh, to, to be here, to be a part of this very vital. This is a poignant conversation to share with my brother that uh, for those of us who are in Christ, that there's really no more urgent, I think essential conversation than one that we're going to have today. I, I greatly wish this could be a kind of bi-directional kind of exchange, but it's still a very poignant um, focus for us today. So um, excited about it. My name is Daryl Williamson, and uh, I've been married to my wife um, for, for 32 years, uh, approaching 33 years. I say to folks all the time, I don't know what I said to her. I'm not sure how I convinced her, uh, but she bought it. So I, I got it at the right moment. And, uh, and so, but I'm very, very thrilled uh, for the life the Lord has given us. Uh, we have uh, uh, two adult children. Uh, our son, Jason, is with the Lord. And, uh, and so um, uh, he was killed in a skateboarding accident um, about two and a half years ago. And but the Lord saved him about a year prior to that. It's been a real encouragement to hear the testimony of his friends uh, who were part of his little kind of discipleship community. And, uh, and so that's been very encouraging to our souls. Our daughter lives in Bristol, Connecticut. And uh, so she works for ESPN. So if you're like looking at ESPN Digital and you're an NBA basketball fan or a college basketball fan, you might see her uh, give some, some pregame pre commentary. Uh, I am on the council of the Gossip Coalition. I also serve on the board, which basically means it's like a part-time job. And, uh, and so, uh, but it, it is... Uh, it's a privilege to, to serve with the, those brothers uh, and the staff. It's a wonderful gospel-centered uh, staff. And so it's a real privilege uh, to, to be, be a part of that. I'm also uh, a part of uh, a new ministry called the Creek Collective uh, that uh, was started by my dear friend, Thabiti Anyabwile and John Obanchequa, uh, Louis Love, Jerry McLean, Aaron Reyes, uh, and myself, uh, focused on, on planting on churches, establishing churches in primarily black and brown communities that are neglected. And uh, so we're very excited about, about that. And, uh, and so thrilled about our conversation today. So here's our task. So there really, there, there, there are four things I want us to cover. I think the first thing that is essential is let's start with the part, sorry about the text and um, it all gets weird when you go to a different, different uh, monitor. But we need to establish theology first. And so we want to work toward kind of a theology of overcoming opposition. What is God showing about himself and what is his purposes in us and how that relates to opposition? Opposition is not only not anticipated, in so many ways in God's kind of economy, it is intended. And so we want to appreciate the significance of that. Uh, and then we want to zone in on Hebrews 12.3. That is our text. And so we want to kind of consider the context and then look squarely at the text and see what the Lord is saying to us about what is the impetus for our perseverance, what drives it, and then how do we fulfill it? That is the question, isn't it? You know, we talk so much about principle. There are all these oughts. How do I have it? It's really the issue. And so we, we, we want to talk about that. And then we want to look at um, a, what we're calling a cloud of faithful witnesses, two persons. I want to focus on our dear brother Paul and our dear brother um, Spurgeon and look at their example. And then just kind of have a moment here of what are some of the significant reasons why it's important for us. It's true in every generation that we finish strong. But there are some significant, there are some particularities, particularities in our time that I think can cause us to compromise that. Then if we have time, I've got some FAQ, um, some questions for us to consider if we have time for that. Let me start my timer. I'm about five minutes in. Give me a moment here. If it recognizes my thumb, well, let's try that. Okay, so toward a theology of overcoming opposition. Here's the question for us is why did God create the church? There are a lot of ways that God could have, could have redeemed sinners. The church is this entity, this institution, this organ that God has created. Why did God create uh, the church? And 
I think it's essential for us to realize that that spiritual conflict is really our defining reality. It's what the world is. I think when, when the Lord was talking about uh, Adam and Eve and, and the fact that they had no knowledge of, of good and evil, there's this sense in which they were unaware of the nature of the, this reality that they were occupying. Conflict is the nature of the reality that we're in. And so we see this very clearly in Revelation 12. We won't take time to go there. You know the story. There is this struggle between the dragon and, and Michael, and they're, they're wrestling, if you will. And then, of course, the dragon is hurled to the earth. There are a lot of interpretations about that. When did that occur historically? What is that? But one thing it certainly speaks to is that this, this, this tension, this conflict, is not something that's bound to the garden. Serpent was before the garden. He arrived there. And so this is our situation. I think that, um, that let's see if I can click ahead here. Let's try this like this. My, I'll tell you what here. I'm doing this on my, <laughs> sorry guys. Oh, geez. Okay, hold on here. Stay with me. I'm, I'm trying to figure out the technology. I'll just speak to it. So in Daniel 10, this is when Daniel had been praying for two weeks and there's no answer from God. And then when, when the angel arrives, he's like, hey, listen, I, mean, I was being held up, but Michael, one of the chief princes came. He came and freed me. The prince of Persia was, was I was wrestling with him. I heard your prayer. One of the things that strikes me about that passage is that he says after he gives Daniel this encouraging word to respond in response to his prayers, like I'm going back to do battle. What is this conflict? But it's there, my friends. It is there in the angelic realm. We see the war in the garden. Again, here comes the serpent. Everything is fine. God's creation is good. The serpent comes in and injects battle, a war, a conflict. There is war in Israel. Here's David. Everything's going well. It says that Satan incited him. Why are you messing with him, Satan? He's not bothering you. But he brings the conflict into Israel. And so the thing that we should appreciate is that spiritual conflict and frustration is, it is our defining reality. It won't always be that way when Satan himself will be hurled into the abyss. But until that day, this is a conflictual reality. Here's what we see. There was heavenly rebellion. There was angelic fall. There was earthly disobedience. There was a human fall. Israel's unfaithfulness meant that God's people Failed. This is our situation. And we're like this. We're like, what the heck do we do with this? How does God respond to this? What is God's rejoinder? What is God's retort? What is his counter move? I think, saints, that the answer is very profoundly seen in Ephesians 3. I love this passage. His, his intent, God's intent, what is God aiming for? It says through the church that the church then, what did God create the church for? What is God's divine instrumentality for the church? What is his objective? Is that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. There are two key, two key things here. One is that the church becomes an instrument of theological expression. It is a way for God to flex. That the church is a way for God to show himself. His manifold wisdom is shown his wisdom, which is to say, in the context of those things that have gone wrong, we need an answer. God's answer is the church. But an answer to whom? Who is this for? Well, it says right here in the text that, that it should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. 
And most of the time when we see that in Scripture, it is speaking not just of all the angelic hosts. It is speaking specifically against the rebellious, that one third, those that rose up against God. We see this in Ephesians chapter 6. And so what, what Paul is saying to us is God's retort, God's battle rap, if you will, to what Satan was trying to say against what God has done is the church. Here's my answer. So the church is God's spiritual and theological counter move. It is a statement about the wonder of God's wisdom. How did you come up with this? Angels long to look into this. And it speaks something compelling about the power of the gospel. Think about those three falling arrows that we saw earlier. Heavenly, failure. Garden, failure. Law, failure. The church, success. And so for us then, the stakes for persevering in faith in ministry are immense. are eternal in their gravitas. It's not just an interesting discussion topic. It's everything. So David understood the stakes. This is David when he, they encounter Goliath. He doesn't just say, oh, is he threatening us? Are we blocked? He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? This doesn't make sense. Who is he to stand up to God's very own people? These questions are, is God in Israel or not? And I think this extends to us. Is the Holy Spirit in the church or not? Are we the, the, the residents of the Spirit of God or not? Are, 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 are we just those who, who claim some kind of principle? Are we are primarily in our essence a confessional entity or are we a possessional entity? That is the question, isn't it? What are we? And as ministers, are Christ ministers called, which is to say, has God spoken and brought them into ministry, and are they filled with his spirit or not? Now, I want to be very clear is that these are not propositional truths. These are not truths to be taught. These are truths to be lived. The faith is not something you define on a slide. The faith is a reality. It is an ontology. It is something that is not something that you declare. It is something that you step into. This is how God does. God does not write what he's trying to say simply on the wall. He writes it in lives. He uses nations. He uses you. My friends, that, that's, what, that's, that's what's at stake here. At the end of the day, who is God? Jesus understood the stakes. He said to Peter, Peter, you're in a battle. You don't realize it. I know that Satan got a hold of you once before. Let me tell you, he's, he wants to get a hold of you again. But he doesn't just want to wrestle you to the ground. He's not trying to block you. He's not trying to frustrate you. He's not trying to fly things around the room. He wants to wreck your faith. But I've prayed for you. Prayed for you. What did you pray, Jesus? That your faith may not fail. So my friends, failure is not an option. It is not something that we can, if we really want to be 
compelling Christians, then we can choose not to feel quitting in the face of opposition or hostility is not spiritually or theologically benign. And what I'm saying by that is not something that you can, you can make it if you want to. If you don't make it too bad, we are still going to get a participation trophy. No. It is urgent, persevering until the end, overcoming resistance and temptation is the very definition of faith and is exactly why the faithful will be commended. And so if we are to endure and overcome resistance to finish well, saints, we need to see and connect with something that is bigger than ourselves. And so in, in, in this sense is that our faithful persistence is not just about our own grittiness. We're dealing with the circumstances in our lives. It is about how do we plug into this great move of God that is encountering cosmological resistance. And if God is moving, if the great river of grace is moving and it is moving to the finish line, if I am in the current, I finish. That is grace. And so we're not talking about trying to become the Marines of faith or the special forces. This is about what it means to be in Christ. Now, let's take a look at our text. The minds focus on finishing. And so here's our text, Hebrews 12, 3, and uh, we're going to go through this. But at first, I think there are some assumptions that we have. The, the very existence of this text helps us to know that not finishing well is a distinct possibility, which is to say there are those who do not. This is not a hypothetical. There's all kinds of conversations and questions about what are the warning passages? What are they? Are they, high, are, are, are they merely illustrations or is there a real risk? I'm going to suggest to you that the Holy Spirit, his word is very intentional. And if that threat was not there, then the warning would not be there. And so we want to understand that resistance can derail us. Here's our second assumption. There are those who have finished well before. Verse 1 of chapter 3, of uh, chapter 12 of Hebrews. Man, I love this letter, or as Julia said last night, this sermon. Therefore, since we are, here it is, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what the writer is saying, or the preacher is saying here, is that there is a, 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 a full record of those who have actually overcome resistance and they have crossed the finish line of faith. You are not doing something novel. God is not asking you to do something that he's not doing. He is doing this. But, but it's not magical. Here's the thing, saints of God, our growth, our resistance, our sanctification, none of those, none of those things happen by default. When we say, this is just an aside, I don't have any notes, so I can't say it's not in my notes, but suffice it to say I wasn't intending to say this, but, but, but the gospel does not do things magically. When we say the gospel is the answer, we're saying the gospel provides the means by which grace engages us so we can walk in some new promise of God. Not that the gospel does it and we get kind of surprised and carried along. It energizes us. The Spirit of God awakens our wills. He connects with our motives. He changes us. So there are those who have been affected, whose faith is genuine, is what the writer is saying here in this passage. Again, our third assumption is that the principle of endurance comes with a practice that apprehends it. Since grace, here it is, always supplies, you can't see it here, always supplies right behind here what it requires. Grace requires faith. In regeneration, grace supplies faith. 
That's how grace works. And so grace is calling us to this. Let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. And so the writer here is saying to us is that we, if we want to be like those who have finished well, we're going to have to kind of, if you will, gird up the loins of our mind or however you want to say it. I've got to energize my will with intent and throw these things off. In so many ways, it's promised us. So let's do it. So let's look at the text. Consider him. Consider him. And again, Julius really spoke to this last night, but I want to kind of look at it here closely today. Consider who? Consider Christ. Now, there are a lot of ways that we can consider Christ. We can consider kind of Christ's work. If you think about Jesus, the Lamb of God, standing in the center of the throne in Revelation 4, I can contemplate that reality and see him there. I can think about what we see in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, the exalted Christ. Christ being there, I'm there with him as he rules and reigns over the church. And so much of what we think about who Jesus is today, we want to think about that this is, this is our Lord who is engaged with us, who has, we see in Acts chapter 3, that he poured out the Spirit onto his people on the Pentecost. This is the risen Christ. But I don't think that's who the writer is speaking of here. Not the exalted Christ, but the faithful Christ. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. The focus here is not the effect of what Jesus did, but the instrument, the means. How did he walk in faithfulness? Saints, let's just be very honest about something here. We are not, as a confession, are always focused on and zoned in on in pursuit of the example of Christ. His walking way is not typically our walking way. Here's one of the ways that we can see this. This is just as an aside. Jesus, it was accused of him. This was an accusation against him. Spent a lot of time with sinners. There is a missionary direction to his life. The cross is a missionary instrument. And I'm a five-point Calvinist like anybody else, and I believe in particular, or at least all of us, many of us in this room, not like anybody else. (laughs) But I'm all down for particular redemption. But I need to understand that the cross of Jesus Christ is a missionary instrument. It is an instrument for the lost. And so there was a heart for, there was an affection for sinners and the broken that Jesus had. Here's the question for us. Is that our focus? And when we think about the fact that we've been placed in a broken world to be on mission for God's redemptive agenda, the fact that we are going to be assaulted within and we're going to become the objects of scorn in that world is not surprising to us. Indeed, it's something we should expect and something in that we will gladly step in. Knowing where God is taking this. And we see in verse 2 that Jesus did this, what it says here, as the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, he's the one that defines it, he's the one that completes it, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He didn't just kind of go through these difficulties, he went through these difficulties purposefully. There was an objective, and that joy was both the commendation of the Father in your rescue. I want you to know that every time one of the Lord's elect come to saving faith, it gives joy to Jesus. Every time 
one in Christ, passes into eternity, when death could destroy them, instead they're ushered into the presence of God because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, it gives joy to Jesus. When those saints come into the presence of the Lord and they join that great heavenly society and Jesus knows were it not for what he did on the cross, they would not be there. It gives joy to Jesus. Seeing that attainment stirred and moved Jesus such that he could scorn the shame of the cross. He's like, that don't matter to me. I ain't worried about that. I don't care what y'all think. I don't care if you think that I'm some kind of criminal. It doesn't matter to me. That doesn't move me. What moves me is the joy that's before me. And of course, again, the exaltation that will come to me. This is what moved Jesus. And the writer is saying, I want you to reflect on that. Meditate on Jesus's way, my friends. And I think it's right for us to assess the space between my way and his. Jesus, are we conjoined? Or am I doing something else, something Christianly, but not Christly? These are the questions for us. And with this mindset, we aren't driven to accept things by how it feels to us. Do I feel affirmed? It's not my first question. Does it feel good that it's not my, I have no peace. Those are not my first questions. My first question is, is this like Christ? We want to understand, my friends, that the cross defines the life of the disciple. What we're saying here is that the Christiform life, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to be like him, this is Paul, Philippians 3, if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to be like him, Jesus said this in Mark chapter 8, then there is a cross for you. I've had conversations with pastors. I'm a pastor. I was going to say this earlier. I mean, I was going to say it later. I'll say it now. Whose first question when there is trouble in their congregation, someone's coming at them, the emails are flying about something. You preached a sermon on election. I recall when we were going through Romans years ago. Hadn't even gotten to Romans 9, man. I was still in Romans 8, and the emails were coming in. I was like, man, what's going to happen in three weeks? I was told, you need to read other books. I'm like, I'm reading one book. And I want to confess something to you. I stumbled. I went through 8. I went through 9. And as we were going into Romans 10, I'm, I'm confessing, brother, please, please don't, don't judge me. I said, Lord, I ain't doing Romans 11. I ain't doing it. I ain't doing it. I'm not getting this whole, all this conditionality. A whole different crew of folks are going to come out and start throwing barbs. We got the pro-Israel folks sitting back there in the back. We went from Romans 10 to Romans 12. I kid you not. You can go to our website and find the sermons. And so it was years later, KD, you're talking to Keenan. I was talking to Keenan. Uh, um, um, uh, Kevin and I have some, he's from Tampa. We have some, some common friends. And she was like, Pastor D, what happened to Romans 11? She, I'm like, is this like the Thomas Jefferson Bible or what? <laughs> And so, so I was like, yes, Lord, we'll go back and get it. And, and it was what an encouraging, encouraging time it was there. But it's very tempting to withdraw, to find purpose in peace, even if it comes with compromise, to think somehow Christ is glorified because we diffuse hostility by skirting something. 
That's not wisdom. Because we, live, we don't go looking for fights. But we don't run from them. If the Lord is being fought, we want to stand with him. The Christiform life is always in necessarily the cruciform life. I think that Smyrna is an interesting example for us. You know this letter very well. You were just talking, Katie, about, about these letters to the churches in Revelation. Here's a church that was under the gun. Jesus shows up, knocks on the door, and says, hey, listen, guys. I'm aware. I know what's happening. Here's the thing that Jesus says. Thanks, we got to feel this. He says, I know your afflictions. I understand the hard things that you're going through. I understand the difficulty. And it feels like so many folks will look at this and observe it and say that's a kind of poverty. That's a spiritual poverty. I understand the difficulties that you have. And Jesus is like, hey, I have a different economy. You are rich. This is the situation. He says, I'm aware of what they are saying about you. I hear the words, every word that said, I know what they're saying and I know how it feels. I was slandered. Do not be afraid, saints, we need to feel this. He does not say, do not be afraid. I will help you avoid the suffering. I got it. When they come to, to punish, to, to persecute, I'm going to intercept that and take it away. He says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. It is going to happen. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. This is such a significant thing, saints of God, because I am convinced that in Smyrna, there were no demonic run prisons. There is this Convergence between the acts of the demonic and what people do. It's always that way. Don't look for flying chairs. I don't know how it works. But somehow Satan and his minions are able to engage with the thoughts. He put the thoughts in David's mind. He somehow convinced Peter to think carnally. But Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. There is this convergence. But here's the thing. I want you to feel this, please. Here's how, here's how things work in the Lord's economy. Is that he grants his enemy... Everything his enemy wants, the very victory, the very thing that they're pursuing. If you want to put me on the cross, put me on the cross. But here's the thing that the Lord does. He will defeat his enemy by letting his enemy do exactly what his enemy is aiming for. You can't be beaten if your opposition achieves their every objective. And by those objectives, you win. And so Jesus says, don't be afraid. They are going to put you in prison. It is going to happen to you. But here it is. Be faithful. Even to the point that everybody wants to avoid. And I will give you life as your victor's crown. I think the NIV translation is really good here because I think when we think about crown of life, sometimes we think about something that is representative Life is the crown. Thank you, Thomas Schreiner. Life is the crown. And I will give that to you if you are faithful. The one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. In other words, everything's at stake in this. It's more than your witness. It is your life. Our time's getting short. I want us to look at just a couple of examples. Our dear brother Paul, our dear brother Spurgeon, 
But there are so many that we can look at. I want to start with Spurgeon. I want to expedite here just for the sake of time. I think there's prob probably not a pastor in this room who wouldn't want a ministry like Spurgeon's. But there's probably not a pastor in this room that would want a life like Spurgeon's. Because this brother had a very challenging time from 22 years old when the new Park Street Church had that stampede. This man entered a new era that sustained for the rest of his life of sorrows. Where perhaps none was greater than what was called the downgrade controversy. It's a significant thing for us because Spurgeon had to make the decision, am I going to stand on what God has said? Now, this is very important for us, saints, because there's a difference between standing on your interpretation of what God has said, right? There are those, there are those, I, I like John Wesley. I'm not a Wesleyan, but I respect John Wesley. I like Wesley, but I'm not a Wesleyan. I disagree with him, but he still preached the gospel, But Spurgeon says, no, I cannot compromise on the authority and heresy of Scripture. I can't compromise on the fact that Christ alone is the means of salvation. I cannot compromise on what it means to die outside of Christ. We cannot compromise on these things. And Spurgeon had tried wisely to avoid the controversy. He did things. To, he wrote some articles in his journal, his, his, his newsletter, trying to explain himself. He stepped outside of the Baptist Union trying to defuse the controversy. None of those things worked. His brother was charged with, to go and try to negotiate some kind of agreement. And this is one of the reasons why, saints, before we can talk about closing ranks, before we can define the, 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 what our unity needs to be, what it needs to look like, we've got to ask ourselves, first of all, where is God? Because the only unity that matters is the unity that unifies around where he is. And once I find his location, if there are others who are standing elsewhere, then Lord, I entrust them to you. And it cost him dearly, it hurt him deeply to see the division within this Baptist association, the name calling, the folks who were accusing him of creating disunity. And his wife was adamant that this accelerated his death at 57. Look at my brother here, because we just talked about how both of us are in our 50s. Am I willing to die sooner? I had uh, one brother, a mentor of mine, to say to me, he said it like this, he said, pastoring, I assure you, you would not live as long as you would have if you were not pastoring. So he said to me, now, I'm not sure if he did the analytics, right? I mean, I, he, it was just his, his intuition as a pastor. Paul. My friend, 2 Timothy is in a remarkable letter. Right here in chapter 1, I'm going to read this because it grabs me. For the Spirit of God gave us, how am I doing on time? For the, for the Spirit of God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or, my, or me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel. Most folks who are in prison, if this is your son, your son in the faith, you're like, don't end up where I am. Let me tell you what I, how I did it wrong so you can, you can go talk to these folks and Figure out this opposition before it lands you in prison. He says, no, Timothy, you get some of this too. You come and get the, join me. Look at me in this dungeon, in the Mamertine prison, you get some. I, 
I don't want to arrive in the Lord's presence surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses with a legacy of compromise. I don't want that. I don't want to slide to the back while others are talking and telling their stories. And I'm over here and just saying I'm thankful for grace. I'm just, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercies. I'm small. I, I, I hid. I don't want that. Paul says, get some. And he, this demotion in this letter, it's astounding. Abandonment, assault. Saints, I'm, I'm accelerating here. Both of these brothers should have been commended. Should have been celebration banquets for Paul. Everybody should have been there. Here's the thing, saints. I want you to feel this, please. That's not the way of the cross. Your commendation is not meant for this world, my friends. That banquet, think of Jonathan Edwards out thinking that his last ministry, which really was his last ministry, out with Native Americans. No one's watching. No one knows who you are. These people don't care. I was reading a farewell sermon of Lemuel Haynes uh, a few months ago as he's being driven out of his ministry. I don't want that. But our commendation is not in this world. It is Christ's commendation that we're aiming for. Let me just say this as we close. There's a tendency, tendency today to emphasize, I'm out of time, am I good? How much, how much time do I have? Five minutes, okay, thank you. Sorry, live streamers, I mean, it seems a little weird for us to be having this little conversation like this. <clears throat> there is a tendency today, if I had a whiteboard, I would put it up on, I would write the word balance. Balance it, brother. One of the first questions I get from folks, it's a good question. It's a helpful question. It's a loving question. It's a needed question. One of the first questions I get from folks when I talk with them, they'll say, hey, man, how's your Sabbath? Talk to me about your rest. That's good. There are good biblical reasons for that. People say, Jesus, Jesus wasn't vacationing a lot, my friends. Jesus, we don't see Jesus vacationing. We see Christ pulling off to be by himself, to be with the Father. He would fast to get along with, 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 with the Father. And we should vacation. It's a good, it's a good general revelation principle. But the Lord's not going to take you to task. Because your testimony mirrored Paul's, who talked about his many afflictions, his being out under the elements, the times he went without food, the uncertainty. That's good counsel, but it's not the main counsel. Don't think your being stretched is inconsistent with the gospel. That your limits is not the boundaries of what God is calling you to be and to do. Doesn't mean you should burn yourself out, or of course you shouldn't burn yourself out. But your first consideration can be, is this, is this okay, is this sustainable? Your first consideration is, is where is Christ? And I can't run from persecution I can't run from the cross. And if I have the mindset 
that, that not only there's something about suffering and persecution and opposition that's right, that's consistent with the nature of this world, that's consistent with God's presence in this world, that Jesus has modeled for us what it looks like, what the redemptive movement of God is going to encounter. I have the mindset such that, like I think Julia said it well last night about that little, little mouse that knows it's going to be saved. When I realize there is a day that I'm going to be commended for this difficulty, I have the, the perspective to endure. I want to encourage you. Don't, don't think it's strange when someone says something to you. It's hurtful. Will you receive opposition for doing what the Lord is calling you to? It really isn't you. It is Christ that they're struggling with. And it is Christ in you that's causing you to share in his afflictions for the sake of his people. Let's go before him now. Jesus, Father, we admit our weakness. We often run from this. We run from this. Father, pray for everyone in this room and those who are, who, who are here virtually. God, I pray that you would move by your spirit to give them stout-heartedness, that you would give them a rugged faith for a rugged call. Yes, give them pace. Help them to know that it's not them, it's you. It's not their resources, it's your spirit. We ask this, Lord Jesus, for your glory's sake and for the cause of your gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, saints. God bless you, saints.